We've now been transported to the place where we join our boat for our cruise along the Bosphorus. I like the way these ferry boats just nudge their nose over the quay and you dive on from there. We'll see more of that later. Everybody's now settled in the saloon. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, we are on Bosphorus now. But we are going upstairs onto the open deck. There are now two bridges over the Bosphorus and that's the first one you can see there. We're sailing northwards of course towards the Black Sea. As we know the Bosphorus links the Black Sea to the Sea of Marmara and then the Mediterranean. It separates the European part of Istanbul from the Asian part. So we have an almost continuous flow of ships going to and from the Black Sea, a large number of which are oil tankers these days. We also have numerous ferry boats linking the various habitations on each side. Then, of course, we also have tourist boats doing cruises up and down. I, at any rate, have never seen such a busy area for shipping, though I dare say the Dover Straits might match it. There's the mosque at Dolma Bache in the way we boarded, and here is the Dolma Bache Palace. The palace was built between 1843 and 1856 as a residence for the Sultan and his family. Previously, the Sultans had lived in the Topkapi Palace, which we will see more of later. The style is neo-baroque. I am told there are 285 rooms, 43 halls and the ballroom has a crystal chandelier weighing four and a half tons. After the declaration of the Republic, the palace was used by Ataturk when he was in Istanbul. It is now a museum but also serves as a guest house and reception venue for important foreign statesmen during official visits. There are several other palatial dwellings along the banks, one at least of which, that's this one, is now a hotel. The strategic significance of this waterway was one of the reasons why Constantine chose this place for his new capital, and this strategic importance has lasted ever since of course. We've come now to the Bosphorus Bridge, or should I say, the first Bosphorus Bridge, because there are two now, they're both just over a thousand meters long. This first one was completed in 1973 by British engineers. The second one, which is five kilometers north, was completed in 1988 by Turkish engineers. And to be honest, I don't know which one it was that we came across the other day. Doesn't seem to be very busy, does it? Ah, there's something there, look. And just north of the bridge, we see the boat that was used by Atatürk when he was president. Along the banks of the Bosphorus, we have these houses, which are called Yarlis, although I think, strictly speaking, a Yarli is one of those built right on the waterside. Having a house here has obvious advantages, a nice view, fresh air away from the city. They were often second homes used mainly in the summer, so you obviously needed to be fairly well off. It was fashionable before the Sultan built the Dolma Bachi Palace, but it no doubt became more so afterwards. Traditionally, they were wooden houses with the best carvings, 
How much this remains the case today, I'm not sure. Um, uh, excuse me, could you get out of the way? I'm trying to make a film here. On the matter of the strategic significance of this waterway, which we mentioned earlier, remember that the Crimean War was caused by Russia trying to gain control, and the landings at Gallipoli were also meant to gain control. Cripes is here again now. After the end of World War I, the Bosphorus was declared to be international territory under the control of the League of Nations. But by stages, the Straits returned to being Turkish territory. Though an international convention agreed in 1936 treats the Straits as an international shipping lane. This water is international water, and I can, I can see, I think that's um, LPG, you know, uh, LPG. And I guess this is what you might call a water taxi zooming over to the Asian side. Now here's a chap in one of those rubber boats, I don't know what he's up to. And here's yet another one of those giant tankers. And here we've got a whole convoy of smaller boats. But now we're coming up to the second Bosphorus Bridge, as you can see, near to which is the Rumeli Fortress. You perhaps remember that when we were in Bursa, we spoke about the Osmanli Turks crossing the Dardanelles and capturing the lands to the west of Constantinople, Thrace, Macedonia, Serbia and Bulgaria. By 1450, they had also pushed their frontiers to the eastern bank of the Sea of Marmara and the position looked like this. They had built a fortress, which we will see later, on the Asian bank of the Bosphorus, and in 1452 they built, just opposite on the European side, this Rumeli fortress. The ring was tightening. The Byzantine Empire was actually reduced to just Constantinople. So here is the second Turkish built Bosphorus Bridge, as you no doubt realize, and it's time that we turned round and catch a glimpse of the fortress on the Asian side, the Anatolian fortress. Now, when we get back to the southern end of the Bosphorus, near where we started our cruise, we'll see a tower built on a tiny island in the narrow part of the strait. This is usually called the Maiden's Tower, but sometimes it's called Leander's Tower. Why Maiden's Tower? Well, it depends who you ask. One person will say that one of the Byzantine emperors around 1150 had a daughter called Leander. When the emperor found out that his beloved daughter was having an affair with someone he didn't approve of, he had the tower built and imprisoned her there. Two other people might tell you that Another ruler, who also had a daughter, was told that his daughter would be bitten by a snake on her 18th birthday and die. So he built this tower, believing that snakes couldn't get there, except in the basket of fruit which he took her for her 18th birthday. One person will tell you that the ruler was a Byzantine emperor, the other will say it was one of the Ottoman sultans. 
Another person will tell you that the tower was built not in the 12th century but in 408 BC by an Athenian general called Alcibiades. A girl called Hero lived here. She was a priestess of Aphrodite who we met earlier. More on that story when we see the tower. Now you can see on 11 o'clock correction. First dome is mosque, second dome is a church, third dome is small one will be seen from our, my, our position upstairs, synagogue. And still these three religions, Turkish citizens today, live together in the same region. At the southern end of the Bosphorus, near where we started, the place on the Asian side is called Uskoda, which is part of Istanbul. It's just opposite the peninsula which forms old Istanbul, and it used to be called Skutari. During the Crimean War, the Ottoman army barracks here had been allocated to the British army. On the 4th of November 1854, Florence Nightingale arrived here with 38 volunteer nurses. In spite of their ministrations, about 6,000 soldiers died here during the war, mainly from cholera. So here's Maiden's Tower coming into view now. A lad called Leander, who lived on the shore, fell for a hero who lived in the tower and swam out each night to visit her. One stormy night, the light which she lit in the tower to guide him blew out and he drowned. The problem is that this story actually happened in the Dardanelles Strait, which is further south and used to be called the Hellespont. Anyway, there's the Dolma Bachi Palace again and we're very near the end of our cruise. And here's our landing key at Kabatash. For me, one of the most remarkable things about this cruise is that the teeming rain stopped as soon as we got on the boat and started again after we got off. Perhaps it doesn't rain on the bus for us. You can see here the chap with the steps which we used to get off. I guess you have to have a fairly skillful driver when you use this method of parking. And here's a little glimpse of some of my fellow travellers. <laughs> 